So, um, last but not least, we have two candidates here tonight for the Kansas Senate District number 37. Um, much the same, we're going to go with uh, one minute answers followed by 30 second rebuttals or uh, addendums, if you will. And so, if I can get Ms. Baumgartner up here first to introduce herself, followed by Ms. O'Hara, and uh, we will go forward from there. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to start by thanking the Miami County Chamber and the Lewisburg Chamber, as well as the Miami County Newspapers for allowing us as candidates, as well as you as voters and taxpayers to hear what we have to say. Um, I've had the honor to actually serve as your senator for the 37th district for the last three months. And I want you to know that the reason I ran for that vacancy when Pat Apple was appointed to the Kansas Corporate Commission is because I felt there were some key areas that really needed representation. The first happens to be a focus on education. I felt that we need to move forward to eliminate Common Core, and we need to absolutely scrap the funding formula because it's not working. My background happens to be in education. In fact, this very building is the first building that I taught in here at the Lewisburg School District. I also have taught for the last seven years at Johnson County Community College. Another area that I felt that um, our voters in the 37th district are concerned about is that we protect our sovereign rights as Kansans. We need to stop the federal mandates and we need to uphold Second Amendment rights. I also think that you want a strong voice that's going to fight against expansion of government and get some control over the massive spending. Thank you.
vote to increase taxes? And I say, no, I absolutely won't. And here's why. One of the votes that I cast when I was in Topeka was the vote for the next year's budget. And what was troubling to me is that next year's budget represented a 17% increase. Even though we had gotten some indication that the revenues were going to lower, in fact, we had a loss of $338 million in revenues. And yet, the proposal was a 17% increase. The fact of the matter is that as the taxes have gone down for our um, taxpayers, we are seeing home sales are going up. In Johnson County, it's just reported that sales are approaching 1,000 homes per month. Retail sales are now exceeding $1 billion per month. And this type of growth is what we need in the state of Kansas. You have 30 seconds to respond or make a dent if you would like. If you would not like, then that's fine. Thank you. Uh, first year that, we, uh, that I was in Topeka 2011, I was one of 11 representatives who voted to amend the budget to freeze it at 2011 fiscal year levels instead of the 12.5% increase that had been uh, uh, promoted by the, by the administration. So absolutely, we have to take a look and make sure that we keep our costs down so that we're not putting pressure on uh, on the revenue side, on the revenue stream that's coming in the state of Kansas. I would just like to reflect on something that was reported just this last week, and it has to do with spending waste. And the report was that four point six million dollars was spent for the contract with the University of Kansas for the state testing. The State Board of Education decided to reject all of the tests that had been turned in because a majority of the tests weren't completed and weren't turned in. So that type of wasteful spending is actually what's hurting us, not the tax base, but it's the wasteful spending. And there has to be accountability in Topeka. Question number two, and this, we're going to start with you, Ms. Baumgartner. What is your stance on gun laws recently passed by the legislature, including House Bill 2052, which allows firearms in public buildings, and House Bill number 2578, which prohibits cities from banning open carry of weapons? You can repeat that. No. Okay. I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment, and I think that what we have seen happen over not just several years, that for several decades is the erosion of the protection of the Second Amendment. I do know that one of the reasons that the second bill that you mentioned as far as um, changing what can and cannot be carried was so that there would be not a confusion as you moved from one county, one city, one township, and so that you knew consistently, if you were in the state of Kansas, you could carry your gun. Thank you. Well, um, I'm a farm girl, and uh, when I was 10 or 11, my dad gave me a 22 rifle to go out back and practice shooting. The good news is that I only almost shot myself in the foot once, and I became quite proficient at uh, killing all of those tin cans. So yes, absolutely, I'm an NRA member. I am a huge, huge promoter. I'm a huge uh, uh, supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, gun rights is an absolute foundational, foundational issue that we must stand and defend. So yes, I support those. I'm a lifetime member of the NRA and I am a Kansas Rifle Association member. Um, the Second Amendment is our sovereign right. And I think that we need to continue to protect that and make sure that it's not eroded. When I was in the precinct race, the different precinct members that I met with, that was the second question they asked me. Where are you on the Second Amendment? So I will continue to fight to protect that. Um, 
When I was in the House, I had 100% pro Second Amendment voting record. So, yes, absolutely. Again, Second Amendment is a foundational issue, and we must protect it. For our third question, and this would be first to Ms. O'Hara, what is your opinion of House Bill number 2506, the Kansas Legislature's School Finance Bill, designed to address the funding inequities identified in the March 2014 Supreme Court ruling? When, when we're talking about school financing, we need to go back to 1994 when uh, the this, this school uh, financing was changed. It went from more of, of from local control to the to the state, and um, unfortunately, in the past few years, it's become an issue that is constantly going back to the courts. We need to stand up as a legislature and say, we are the ones that control the purse strings, not the courts, and that has not been communicated at all. And uh, it, this is a mandate uh, at best. It's already been challenged in court again. And until we really get serious about revisiting the school funding formula and standing up to the courts and saying, no, this is the legislature's responsibility for funding. And, and we are not going to bend to the courts wishing we're going to stand up to them. I mean, that's the only thing that we can do if we want, if we want to get our control back. I want to share with you my frustration with the bill that was passed. I'm a school teacher, you know that. The approach that our legislature takes in the funding formula is that of a high school student that has an essay due. It's been due for several weeks and they wait until the night before they're supposed to turn it in and they try and cram it all together. Now ladies and gentlemen, we spent roughly 68% of our state's budget on public education. That means it shouldn't be the last day or two of a legislative session into two, three, four in the morning trying to hastily put together a budget. I believe that it should be something that we start at the very beginning of the session. In fact, I'll take it even further, it should be mandated that the education committees be working during the summer on the education budget. Now that being said, we have a state board of education that just this week has proposed a new budget spending for next year that is a 13% increase and it will be $459 million. So we need to be more realistic about the spending that we're wanting for our public education. One thing that hasn't been talked about yet, and I think that is a crit critical element in this whole discussion is school choice. We need to have competition. We need to have competition to make sure that uh, the costs are contained on the public sector. If you don't have competition, anyone is going to get bloated and sloppy in their spending. And our schools, I mean, it's brick and mortar and lots and lots of administrators. And part of that is because of the federal funds coming in, mandating us to, to put in these programs. It's, it's killing us with paperwork. We need to stop taking these federal funds, which is 7.5% of the education budget, and get back to educating our kids. Just as a rebuttal, I would like to add a few interesting um, points. We spent, um, on average, almost $13,000 per student in it for education for the K through 12. But at Johnson County Community College, where many of our students from Miami County, and lots of students from Johnson County attend, the fact of the matter is that those incoming first semester students, 80% of them have to take remedial courses because they're not adequately prepared for college. So one of the things that we do have to have is accountability in our education. Keeping on the education front, um, Common Core. Common Core curriculum, um, what are your 
your thoughts with regards to it? Um, and what do you think its impact in, in Kansas is? Yes. <laughs> right. I want to talk about Common Core because I've been talking about it and actually speaking with groups for some time before I was even in the Senate. I have said to, to many, I've said it publicly, that the state of Kansas needs to take a wooden stake and it needs to drive it through the heart of Common Core. <laughs> it is wasteful spending. It is a program that was nothing more than a poison apple that the federal government set, set out for us and we grabbed that apple. And when we grabbed that apple, it put a whole lot of financial burden and it put us as a state into a situation where we were to come up with new standards. We were to implement those in the classroom and none of those standards had even been completed or tested. So you talk about the grand experiment. Common Core is an experiment, and as a teacher and as a mother of four kids, I don't want my kids experimented on. I first found out about Common Core in 2013, and I was at the, in the education committee testifying against it. Uh, there's 400 data points that are being collected on, on your children. The testing requirements uh, are, are ludicrous. And, uh, but the only way that we're going to get out from under this again is to stop taking the federal funds. Because if we, if we opt out of Common Core, which would be wonderful, then we're going to go right back to No Child Left Behind, which is a horrible so we are, we need to free our teachers. We need to, in Kansas, declare our independence, cut the cord on federal funds, because that's the only way we're going to get rid of the, of the national standards, is to stop taking the federal funds. They give us the funds, then we are under con contractual agreement to abide by their rules. Every time we take federal funds into the state of Kansas, we are giving away our state sovereignty. Common Core spending is like sand through an hourglass. We spend it on new materials. Common Core is designed so that that testing is only on a computer. It is a computer system, and it is a system that is a money drain for our school districts. I've met with superintendents to, for the different school districts that are in my Senate district. They all complain about the time suck and the cost that it is draining on their budgets. I was talking to a teacher as I was going door to door and she said, we need help. She said, I don't have time. I have three children that are middle school age. And they're in the system now. And we need, we need help now. It is, it is a nightmare. One thing that you can do is that you can opt your children out of the testing. Tell your, tell your, tell your kids to, to not allow your grandkids to take those tests. They can opt out. And if we start the beast, then we will start getting their attention. Thank you. For our final question, what are your thoughts on the Affordable Care Act and how it affects or impacts Kansas citizens? Yes. Okay, well, I was on the front lines of uh, battling the early implementation of Obamacare in 2011. Uh, I was a freshman in the house, and one of my colleagues came up and said, Charlotte, you need to really research this early innovator grant. It was a $31.5 million federal grant coming into the state that would have required us to build a state exchange. We were, we were building all the IT infrastructure. $31.5 million. 
I went out and I, I researched it and every other paragraph was compliant with the Affordable Care Act. I stood up and I said, no, this is wrong. And out of 125 representatives, there was only one other representative that stood up with me, and that is Representative John Rubin. But with the state delegates, after I got the information out, and after I was removed from the interim uh, or the interim insurance committee, because I was on the Chris Kovach show talking about it, we were successful in getting that money returned. So when you stand up and fight, you can be successful. Again, the question was, what are your thoughts on the Affordable Care Act and how it impacts Kansas citizens? I can honestly tell you that I have not spoken to a single Kansas citizen that says thumbs up. When we talk about the Affordable Care Act, it has been frustration since day one. Folks that tried to sign up couldn't sign up. Again, this is another federal example of we're being test subjects. They're testing it on us. They rolled out a system. It wasn't ready to be rolled out. And it's not providing us any benefits. In fact, what it's doing for Kansans is creating more frustration. I'm opposed to it. I think we should fight it. It's just like another federal mandate that's not good for us. Again, I've been on the front lines. I stood and I fought, and I paid a political price. Because if you stand up to the status quo, you're going to have a target on you. They don't like that. They want you to basically sit down and shut up and just go with the flow. Go along to get along. In fact, my colleagues told me when I was uh, speaking out on this, on this issue, Charlotte, you need to learn to live to fight another day. And I said, if you're not going to fight for this, then you're not going to fight for anything. I'm not sure much more I can tell you about it other than opposed to it. I, like I said, I have not met anyone that is supportive of it. We will, we will ask both of you, beginning with uh, Ms. Baumgartner, you have 30 seconds, clo uh, any closing thoughts that you have for uh, the group? I'd like to thank you again for being here this evening. Um, I would just like to say that when I ran for this position three months ago, I ran because I wanted to serve you. I let my constituents know, this is my cell phone number, this is my email address, this is where I live. Call me, email me, write me. And I've heard, I've heard from folks about their concerns. I've met with our county commission. Um, I've met with our state agencies. And it's my job, I feel, as a state senator, to serve you, to help you. And that's what I hope to do for the next two years. Thank you. What an honor it is to be here tonight. And uh, thank you for attending. Uh, yes, to, to have the honor of serving the people of the 37th District would just be an incredible experience. I'm out going door to door talking to people because I am not the establishment candidate. The, the powers to be in Topeka do not want me back because they know that I will do the research, I will out them when they are not going with the Republican platform. And I would just ask for your support and your vote on August 5th. Thank you. In closing, I will repeat that you can, uh, at this time, uh, cast your ballot, your advanced ballot, or vote in person at the Miami County Clerk's Office. Um, we want to thank all of our candidates here tonight. Um, 
we uh, win or lose, we admire you for standing up for what you believe in and uh, being a voice for Miami County. We want to thank the middle school. Um, I'm sure the candidates will still be around for a few minutes if you'd like to ask them some questions personally. But uh, on behalf of uh, our sponsors, thank you for coming, and we will see you later.